started, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for coming. I am so very excited about this visual arts. We asked Elizabeth about, well, it was at the first of the year to present. And um, this is something that you guys have asked for. We always survey and ask our alternative education programs, what are your needs? And this was one of your needs. And so I hope you get a lot out of this. Petra is um, usually the uh, person that introduces everybody. So Petra is our executive director of alternative ed. And then we also have another field person, Leslie um, Frazier, but she is out today. So you get me, but I'm gonna hand it over to Elizabeth. Hi everyone, welcome to our session this afternoon. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Mon. I'm the Director of Fine Arts and also Advanced Placement at the Oklahoma State Department of Education. And I have a couple co-presenters today and they include Maria Cray Gibson and she is a dance educator with Putnam City Public Schools and Morgan Brown. She is a visual art educator with Jenks up in the Tulsa area. And then we also have Jennifer Allen Barron with us and she is the Education Director with the Oklahoma State Arts Council. So I brought them all on board because they some of them have been teaching in an online space. They all have experience in different areas um, with the arts and with alt ed. So they should be able to contribute greatly to the conversation today. A bit of an overview before we get started. I'm going to cover some best practices of online fine arts teaching that maybe you can share with folks. Um, in the future. And then Morgan and Maria are both going to address online teaching successes and challenges that they've had so far this year. They both taught online um, at different times throughout the fall semester. And then Jennifer will cover some grant opportunities for alternative education arts classes that you'll want to be aware of. So starting off here with best practices, um, online teaching is no different from being in person, and we all know this, and students want to know that they will be seen and heard, that they can be successful in class, that the teacher is willing and able to help when they need it, and that classmates will not ridicule, tease, or bully. And of course, empathy is a big key to this, and empathy extends to the student, but also to the families that they are living with. And we know, um, especially with alternative education, that they're facing all sorts of challenges um, in their home lives so that arts educators should really assume that all families and their students are doing the best they can with the situation that they have. And I have a link there to um, a little article on empathy and distance learning you'll be able to access from the PowerPoint after this. And of course, if we do our jobs right, then we'll have a positive trust in class culture, which will lead to much better outcomes for the students and their education as a whole. Uh, some things to keep in mind when you're designing curriculum and assignments for an arts classroom or any classroom, whether it's in person or virtual, are these things that I'm sure are familiar to a lot of you. First off, social and emotional learning. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard of SEL. It's the process through which students improve emotional self-regulation, develop responsibility and awareness of peers' emotional states, and gain confidence in expressing complex ideas um, that come from personal thoughts and feelings. And a lot of the time, arts curriculum is majority SEL, uh, just because of the way the arts work with kids. But if you're curious to learn more, there's a link there to an article you can explore. Uh, the second bullet there is culturally responsive instruction. And the site that I have linked is Zaretta Hammond's site for culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Um, this is where you're understanding the student's culture and uniting it with a curriculum um, which can develop connections between the student, academics, and school in general. And when you do this with the arts or any subject area, um, it really helps the students see the relevance of that um, subject within their own lives. And then we also have project-based learning, um, which PBL is a method where students learn by actively engaging in real world and personally meaningful projects. A lot of times our arts classrooms are just a whole bunch of P PBL projects Kind of sewn together. Um, in virtual learning, project-based um, learning looks a little bit different because you have to reimagine it. So for example, if you have a PBL unit where the students are finishing up a visual art assignment and they need to do peer critiques, you'd have to think through in a virtual space, what will that look like? Because you'll need to have new norms set up and give the students time to practice 
et cetera. So rethinking that for the virtual art space. And then we also have place-based learning, which I think, I hope a lot of educators are taking advantage of right now, especially if they have students learning at a distance. This is where uh, you take advantage of geography to create authentic, meaningful, and engaged personal learning for the students. So you ask them to bring in their local heritage, their local cultures, where they live, et cetera, and bring those things into the curriculum. So there's an article link for that as well. And then as far as strategies for curriculum and assignment success, of course, get to know your students through available demographic data and just by talking to them, uh, considering what their interests and needs are, especially in regards to social emotional learning and their own culture. Uh, involve the students as you build project and ask for their input. Give them a why behind the learning goals. And then think outside the box and give the students agency as much as possible and include that place-based education. Um, one scenario I've been thinking about is I'm primarily a music educator and perhaps I really love the Baroque era of music history. It's my favorite thing. I love recorders. I love harpsichords. I think they're just incredible. Of course, that's a Western European tradition that most students today I don't think are very familiar with. So if I examine the demographics of my students and realize what their needs are, maybe Baroque music wouldn't be the best place to start uh, in my curriculum as I'm building that with the students. I could certainly still teach Baroque music, have the students explore that, but I need to find different avenues to get them there rather than just jumping into, here's a harpsichord that they've never ever seen before. Um, with lesson planning and creation, a great way to go about it, especially if you're transitioning a in-person classroom to an online is to do the backwards planning that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So thinking about, okay, I have this unit. What do I want students to know and be able to do by the end of it? How will I know if they've learned it? What will they show me? And then how will they um, demonstrate success with that? And then a sample lesson structure that could work um, maybe over a week or two weeks um, could be these steps that I have listed on the screen here. So beginning with a lesson content that's introduced through short readings, videos, or presentations, and then also give project prompts, um, keeping in mind SCL competencies, cultural responsiveness, and place-based learning built in as much as possible uh, in order to see the final learning outcome. And also when you're introducing, go ahead and give the final rubric to the students so they know what uh, they're aiming for at the end of the project. Discussions, I know that discussions in a virtual space, sometimes they go really well, and sometimes those discussion boards I'm sure all of us have been in the situation where it's pulling teeth to get a response from any of your classmates. So checking for understanding in the discussion boards, trying to make those creative as much as possible so the students are building community through those discussions. Of course, adding in a formative assessment where the students practice and experiment with new techniques or ideas. And then a summative assessment at the end where students show off their skills and maybe upload a video or picture of an art assignment, et cetera, to an LMS. And then a reflection at the end where students explain their thinking and learning through short reflection questions at the end. This is a lot. Um, I know I've taught online classes uh, at the university level where I haven't ever met the students. And it's tricky to try to have an engaging hands-on arts experience through an online course. So if you've looked at all of this and wonder, that's a lot to do, I'd really love it if somebody would come in and maybe offer this for us, you are in luck. Uh, we have a new federal grant, it's called the Art Tech Grant. Um, through the SDE, we awarded it from the uh, federal government in the fall. And this is a grant for pre-K through 12 Oklahoma schools. And how it will work is we will have hybrid arts classes offered throughout the year for free to interested school districts, school buildings. Um, in the pre-K through eight level, they will, the lessons will be taught by a classroom teacher. And then once a month, a teaching artist will come in and do a hands-on arts experience with those students. At the high school level, it will be student directed. So the students will have a device and they'll move through the curriculum on their own and then meet with the teaching artist once a month. At the end of the year, there will be an art installation, art show, dance experience, uh, dance performance, music performance, whatever it is for the different disciplines so that they'll kind of have a cumulative end of the year experience. All the assignments will be online. And this next 
fall 21-22 school year, we will be launching the dance and visual art curriculums. So your students in your schools could take advantage of that. And then in 22-23, we will add in music and drama theater. And these classes will be available through 24-25. So you have some time to take advantage and maybe see uh, what you could do in the future. And then all the curriculum will be available after the grant is over. So that will be something that will be living and breathing and maybe you could take and use with students in the future in your own sites. So if you're interested in that grant, that is a link to the website there at the bottom of the slide. We're really excited to get this started. And I think, especially at the high school level, if you have kids who need that arts credit and they maybe they do have a little bit of interest in dance or maybe they've never been able to take a visual art class, um, hasn't been offered, et cetera, they can do that through the online experience and have the hands-on with it. So exciting new grant that we have going on. All right, so I'm going to turn it over now to Maria. She's a dance educator with Putnam City Public Schools, and she's going to share some of the teaching successes and challenges that she's had so far this year. Hi, everybody. I am Maria Craig Gibson. I am the dance teacher at Putnam City High School. I saw a lot of Putnam City in the chat, so hey. Um, so this semester, Putnam City was primarily um, distance learning. We did have three weeks where we tried to meet in person on a block schedule with an ice storm in the middle. So we saw our students maybe twice uh, before we had to go back to distance learning for the rest of the semester. This semester, I had three units of uh, movement that I focused on and that was ballet, jazz, and hip hop. In all three units, I had a Nearpod history lesson and then for ballet and jazz, I taught four eight counts of movement for the students to then uh, record themselves doing that movement and submit that video for a grade. Um, I was not grading whether they did it right or wrong. I simply uh, gave them points for completing that task. And then uh, I would always give them feedback for one or two areas that they could improve on if they uh, were interested. And then the hip hop unit was a little bit different because after the history section, I uh, assigned a creative project in which they would, uh, their project would utilize two of the four elements of hip hop, that being um, emceeing, DJing, breaking, and graffiti. Um, and then, oh, then after all, that's where I was like, I had to switch it the other screen, no problem, thank you. Um, and then after each section, they had a reflection, um, just asking them about what they learned and uh, how, if it was different from what they expected. So that does bring me to um, the challenges and successes that happened. So the challenge list is longer, but I promise it's not all negative. Um, so the video assessments, to be honest, were a flop. There were students who completed them and the students who completed the video assessments uh, grew exponentially every time because um, I think they also just had a, that mindset. They already were adventurous enough to record themselves. Um, so they were open to receiving critical feedback. Um, I think the reason why the video assessments had less engagement was because when your body is the tool of assessment, it requires vulnerability and um, while we are learning how to do this, uh, I didn't really have a complete vision of how to build trust and community um, on a digital platform. It was a trial and error, error um, experience. So then I also had to consider when you are uh, recording and uploading a video, you might not have the internet access that supports that. So we lacked the equity to um, offer that experience um, authentically. And then um, another challenge when I think about specifically the jazz and ballet assessment, the, the why, the whole purpose of that was to actually collaborate and create more choreography. Um, and digital learning just did not have that ease. Um, and it seemed more stressful to bring that on the students in a digital platform. But 
the successes were the reflections, um, whether or not the students completed the video assessments, they almost always completed the reflections. And that's where I was able to uh, witness a shift in their awareness that they were more um, conscious of where the things that they were consuming for entertainment were coming from. And then I think the hip hop creative project was so successful because it gave students autonomy to choose their modality of creative expression um, instead of saying, hey, this is MKG meet, that's what the students call me, my choreography and you're learning it and you're going to reproduce it. It was them being able to say, this is my artistic voice. So specifically, um, I had one student create a COVID rap and how she was irritated that COVID ruined her senior year. I had another student create a beautiful spoken word poem um, about her relationship with her mother. And it was very, um, heartwarming to bear witness to that student um, participate in her own healing through creative expression. Um, so those were the successes. And I think that my takeaway from all of this, um, dance education has existed in OKCPS uh, since the beginning of OKCPS. And however, there wasn't the educators to fulfill those um, allocations or those vacancies. And so we see our largest burst happening after 2011 when UCO started the program, the dance education program. Um, and all of us, like almost all of us came from a private uh, dance studio background. So in these past 10 years, we have been coming into the public education realm and redefining what dance education looks like to make it accessible to more people. That then in this 10th year, um, we had to redefine it for what does that look like in a digital platform? And when I really uh, sat back and reflected, my hope, and I believe what the community's hope is, is that the experience that we offer, whether it's online or in person, is that we're empowering our students. Um, and then that empowerment, I think, is what allowed me to really see that you don't have to have a physical experience to necessarily have a shift of awareness. That was the most fulfilling part of seeing their reflections when they said, I assumed dance was this because this is what I see. I'm so sorry, my dog is barking at the mailman. Um, so the shift in the, uh, their perception was very fulfilling to see that dance on the media, like whether it was social media or like, so you think you can dance was not exactly what they, thought it was when they learned the history and why uh, certain dance uh, movements happened. And then the last thing I reflected on was, so I was at OKCPS for eight years and I had the time to build trust and community. So when I came over to Putnam City in 2019, the school year was interrupted by um, COVID closing down the schools. So thank you, Bear. Um, that being said, if you have a new performing or visual arts program in your school that started in 2019 or 2020, um, please consider that maybe their low en enrollment and their low engagement right now isn't because they are not a good teacher, but it could be because it is challenging to build trust and community online, um, especially in these areas where it requires so much vulnerability. Thank you. Thank you. Great points. All right. And next up is Morgan Brown. She's a visual art educator in Jenks. Hi, guys. Thank you for coming today. Um, yeah, I've had a little bit of a, a very similar experience that Maria was talking about. It's all about building community and trust. And if that trust isn't there, the kids aren't going to, they're not going to get vulnerable with you. And art in general is a vulnerable situation whether it's you know using your body to to communicate something or putting your thoughts and feelings down on paper they don't always want to do it um especially when they're at home on their own <laughs> so i'll talk to you a little bit about kind of the the logistics first and then kind of what worked for me and what hasn't worked for me there's some, been some spectacular failures in the last uh whatever this has been year <laughs> um 
So the biggest question that everybody asks in visual arts in particular is supplies. What, what do you do with supplies? How do we get supplies to kids? What are they making the artwork out of? Um, and I, there's some options here and I've kind of gone through all three of them in various stages. Um, so when we initially went into quarantine, I didn't have the chance to get any supplies to my kids. Um, and I teach multiple uh, multiple different things. I'm a seventh and eighth grade art teacher currently, but I teach art one, art two, which is a sculpture class, collaborative art, which is a collaborative sculpture class. You can imagine how that went um, when everybody's by themselves. Um, and then also a couple of art history classes. So when we went into quarantine initially, what happened is I just had to get very creative. There was no I mean, it was there was no opportunity for a pickup or a drop off or for students to get supplies because that just wasn't a reality at that time. So um, kind of fell back on recycled materials, giving students lots of options in terms of what they could use to create um, the whatever piece it was. Uh, when we got into the springtime, getting them outside for that sculpture class and having them use found object sculptures. Um, they needed to get out of the house anyways, even if it was just into their backyard or out onto near the sidewalk at their apartment complex, like just getting them out physically out of the house was a good thing. So getting creative is one thing for sure, especially if you have a limited budget. If um, you have the supplies at your school and you just need a way to get them to the students, whether that's through you assessing a fee and then buying the supplies, you can offer pickup days and drop off days um, for certain things with uh, the clay unit. I found that this actually worked um, quite well. We did clay virtually. <laughs> it was crazy, um, but we managed it and the students who just could not get to the school to drop the piece back off, I went and picked them up. Um, they, I'm lucky enough that where I had two other art teachers to help me out uh, and we just kind of took shifts and going, we went and I said, put it on your front porch, I'll come grab it <laughs> and during this 30 minute time slot and it worked out. And then I took it to the kiln and, and brought it back to them or let them come pick it up when it was time. So that's an option for sure. And then the option that we've usually we've been using the most has been the provide a list, um, a, a limited list, we really pared it down. I sat down with my colleagues and said, what do we absolutely have to have for them to complete these projects and to complete the curriculum? Um, what's the bare minimum that is accessible to them? And we put together a list at Walmart, a list at Target, a list at um, Michael's, one at Hobby Lobby, and then one in Amazon. So whatever they needed, it was there was a, a variety of options for them. Um, and we let students know that if for whatever reason they just weren't able to get the supplies to please reach out to us, let us know, have their parents reach out to us because the communication is obviously going to parents as well. Um, and we would work something out. We had a, a backlog of a couple supplies since we didn't get to finish the semester last year. Um, so we did have the ability to kind of hand out a limited amount. So that's the supply question. You do have options. It's totally doable. It gets a little bit crazy, but it is doable. Um, the other thing is really being organized. It's just like any art class. We, have, we are so supply heavy. It is unreal. So you're always kind of juggling who's doing what and what's going on at any given time. So having a calendar for your students is the biggest thing. Jinx in particular uses Canvas and they, you know, they we really kind of bought into the Canvas model and it works. But even if you don't have Canvas, you can use the Google Classrooms, which is totally free and that works great. Um, and we ended up doing Google Meet anyways instead of Zoom because Jinx didn't want us to use Zoom. So for security reasons. And Google Meet's been great. I had a class specific link for each class that I just linked onto their Canvas homepage. They always had access to that. And if they sent me a message and said, hey, can you jump on here? I just have a five minute question Then we could immediately get on there. It wasn't this whole scramble of trying to get together a link. So being organized on the top end is super helpful. Um, I would send out a, or I do send out because we're still virtual right now, um, not because of COVID necessarily, but because we have no heat in our building. Um, but uh, I would send out a Google document every week that just had like a little table in it and it would say Monday, Monday through Friday what the students were doing, what was expected of them. Um, it was a direct copy of what was on their Canvas calendar, but then underneath it, what supplies they needed for that week. Um, and that worked beautifully, especially when we had kids in person and kids that were quarantining. So everybody was on the same page. Everybody knew what they had to bring to school that day and what they didn't have to, or if they were at home, what they needed to gather up. So that was super helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Next, so the document camera is my life as a visual arts teacher in a virtual setting. I have got to be able to demonstrate. If I can't physically demonstrate the technique, then <laughs> what, what are we doing? So basically I would find, um, if occasionally you can find YouTube videos and whatever, but half of the YouTube videos are, uh, and they go away quickly and some districts aren't allowed to use YouTube and things like that. So I just made my own um, and I would use my document camera. My favorite one is the one that IPVO put out. It's not very expensive. It's like a little, I don't even know. It's a tiny little IPVO camera and it's incredible, um, but it does video. It takes uh, audio recordings. I could do split screen. I could do time lapse. So a variety of, and it was movable. I mean, we're talking the camera was tiny. So if I needed to fold it up and put my bag and go home with it, I could, which was great. It wasn't like the huge Elmo cameras that we used to have to kind of load around and it was a lot cheaper. So um, that was nice. And, but what I ran into was I needed to upload relatively large videos. And so I use the YouTube workarounds. And what I mean by that is if you don't want your video to be public, um, you can get a YouTube account, which is the same as a Google account. They're all the same. And um, you can upload it as unlisted. And only the people who you share the link with are able to look at it if it's unlisted, which is great. And so I would just put that on the student's calendar for the week. They would click on it. They could watch my demo. Um, what I found about having pre-recorded demos is that the accessibility for my students who had language difficulties or special education difficulties, it was incredible because they could pause and go back and rewatch as many times as they wanted. Um, and so I'm going to keep doing this even when we're not virtual because if the student is absent and you need to, you don't have to go back and reteach, it's there. They can see it, they can go back um, and look at it at any time. So of course it's not gonna replace live in-person demos, but it is a fabulous tool to have on hand, um, regardless of whether we're, we're virtual or not. Um, then after that, when the students start creating their work, the biggest thing is you've got to have face-to-face -face time with them. Um, and that can be physical face-to-face -face time in a Google Meet, or that can be through a private discussion board or just an email exchange, but there's got to be some kind of accountability for the kids. Um, so what I would do is midway through the project, one or two times, I would have them send me a sketch. I would have them send me an in-progress photo, and we would have a discussion. Um, with middle school, it's more one-on-one -on -one critiques than it is group critiques because they're pretty vulnerable <laughs> and they're pretty terrified. So the the one-on-one -on -one is definitely better for them. Um, but we, with my advanced art class, it's definitely group critiques. Um, I would do my critiques on Thursdays and Fridays, and then their project would be due until Monday. So even if they had a, a schedule situation um, to where you know they they just got it or they didn't get started or whatever because there's so many distractions when they're at home and especially if they've got interesting family situations or if they're working or anything like that nobody is on the same schedule right now um so giving them that extra time and grace was key because they, they were going to get the work done it just it might not be in my time <laughs> which is fine um and just making sure that they knew that if there was ever any problem, they, they could communicate with me and having a very clear and open, honest dialogue and a clear line of communication to where if they had questions, they could get to me. Okay. So the biggest thing is, um, you know, visual arts is, is pretty uniquely suited to do this. <laughs> we are, we can adapt really well to, to virtual learning because most of the time, aside from my collaborative art class, uh, most of the time it's a, it's a personal thing. It's a one person event um, that happens. And so as long as the student has, a, you know, open and honest communication with the teacher and they feel safe, um, communicating with the teacher, you're going to be okay. They're going to, they're going to take those risks as long as they know that they're safe to do so um, and that they have, they have you there to support them. Awesome. Thank you. All right. And now we're going to switch over to Jennifer with the Oklahoma Arts Council. All right. Hello. Um, do I just give you one of these if I want you to, um, forward the slide. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. So um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm Jennifer Allen Barron with the Oklahoma Arts Council. Um, nice to join you all today. Thanks for, for being here and, and listening in. Um, next slide, please. 
so um, I have, I'm here to talk about some of the resources that our agency offers to alternative schools. We have some grants and we have some additional resources as well, but I want to start off with our grants because um, that's kind of the, the bulk of what we do. If you have attended any of these, um, back when we used to have the Alt Ed Hub meetings in person, you might have seen me go over these a few times. Um, if you've attended more than one of them, you might be able to recite all this information on your own. Um, but I just wanted, I'm not gonna go and do a super deep dive on the nuts and bolts of how to apply for the grants. I just wanna give you a little bit of information about what our grants are, what you can use them for and how you can get started. So there are two grants that alternative education schools can apply for, our classroom supply grants and arts and alternative education. Um, next slide, please. So the classroom supply grants, this is a newer grant that we have just launched. This is our second year of offering this. And um, these are grants that can pay for consumable supplies. Um, they can pay for fine arts supplies in any discipline for which your school has at least a part-time teacher. So you, those can be music supplies, dance, drama, visual arts supplies, but your school has to have at least a part-time teacher in that discipline in order to be eligible to apply. Um, we have a list on our website of examples of what um, consumable supplies might look like in each of the disciplines, but basically, you know, for, um, let's say, visual arts, um, I think it's pretty easy to kind of get an idea of what that might be, um, paint, paper, canvases, um, ceramics, glazes, mixed media supplies, but not things like easels or pottery wheels or equipment. So things that are really, you know, used up or transformed during the course of instruction. For dance, it might be, um, for dance, music, and drama, like um, you could buy rights to, um, or especially I think this is more for music and, and drama, licensing rights to do performances. Um, let's see, for dance, um, of course, cleaning supplies. This is for, you know, once it's safe to meet in person, any kind of PPE can be um, purchased using these grants because, you know, even though that's not specifically an art supply, that PPE does allow your students to participate in the arts safely and access the arts. So we, we do consider that an eligible expense. Um, and again, there's a, a more full list on our website, but each school can receive up to one of these grants per year, in addition to the other grant. So if you have questions about these, please hang on to them. I know we're going to do some questions at the end, of, and I'd love to, to talk to you about that. But um, basically, no match, $500 maximum, consumable only, one per school. I think that's the, that's the gist. Next slide, please. And then arts and alternative education, as the name implies, this is a grant that is specifically for alt ed schools. And this grant, um, each award can be up to $2,500. Um, and a school can usually, usually schools can receive up to two of these per year. This year we've expanded that to up to three applications per year. Um, these do require a match. Most of our grants for nonprofits are a one-to-one -one match. Um, for traditional schools, it's a 10% match, and for alt ed schools, it's a 5% match. We, um, we have to put that match in there. It's something that's uh, required by our legislation, but we've kept it as low as we possibly can. So, you know, for a 2500 Is she frozen for everyone? Yeah, she is. Yes. I we'll think give she her dropped. a moment. <laughs> Working from home with internet. Yes, it's fun. Uh, no, actually, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, apologies for jumping on late, but um, hey, um, it's all, not all it's cracked up to be. Oh, she popped out. Maybe she's gonna try and log back on. Get her back. While we're waiting, um, Elizabeth, I did want to uh, thank, I think it was Maria who had the comment about you're not a bad teacher, um, lack of engagement, you know, to consider the environment that we're in right now. Uh, I thought that was so um, powerful because teachers can get down because kids aren't responding or doing whatever, but, um, 
it may be the platform, it may be, you know, that part, that struggle. So thank you for um, saying that. Mm-hmm. This year is definitely not a commentary on your teaching abilities. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, absolutely not. And I was so glad they, uh, since we have teachers on here that they voted to not have that portion of the TLE, um, still do your professional learning focus, um, which we all should do anyway uh, every year. But uh, that just takes some of the pressure off of being evaluated. And as an, a former administrator, well, I guess you never take your hat off, not having to put teachers in that position and having to do that. I just was like, oh, yes. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, um, well, back yet. while we try to get Jennifer back, what would you like to? Um, Let me see here. Um, do, do you want to take some? Yeah, if you have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat and we will do our best to answer them. Under a quick email with the link. I don't think the waiting room is still on, so I don't, I can't see that. Gary will let her in. Okay, yep. <clears throat> it's open, they can come in anytime. I can tell you that I have worked with Jennifer for the last four years. She's usually a presenter at all of our regional meetings and she goes over her grants with um, each of us. And part of the process sometimes is actually just getting the login and user ID. She says that's the hardest part of it, but know that anybody that's working at the Arts um, Council will help you with that process. And last year was the first time that she actually had the $500 grant. And I know a number of our alternative education programs took advantage of that. And as we're out evaluating those programs, we're seeing amazing things with just that $500 because that's really important sometimes to an alt ed program that doesn't have any supplies. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot, a number of our programs have brought in dancers and um uh, artist in residency and continue to do that. I know it's a little different. Some of them are Zooming now. So don't ever think that that what isn't something that you might want to entertain in your alt ed programs because the programs that are using those grants can't say enough about them. Thank you. Thank you, Missy. Oh, hi, Jennifer. Okay, I'm getting back. Hi. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I appreciate you um, picking up the ball there and, and uh, sharing that information and those good success stories from some schools. And thank you, Elizabeth, for sending me that link. I don't know what happened. One second I was talking and one second there was nothing, but that's another part of our new reality, isn't it? So um, so anyway, um, again, um, our arts and alternative education grants are another way to hire an artist to lead a, a virtual residency. Um, so if you have an idea I just put at the bottom, please contact me to discuss your project ideas. I'd be happy to help you, especially if you're a first time um, applicant within our system, be happy to help you navigate that and um, just talk to you about what you might have in mind. So um, whew, that was exciting. <laughs> Next slide, please. So if you want to apply for either of these grants, the first thing that you need to do is to get a login request for your school. And you can do that at our website, the arts.ok.gov. Um, Heidi Costello oversees that process and she is a pro at it. So she can help you with that. So that is, but you need, whichever one you do, you need to do that. And then once you have that login request, you can, you don't have to go through that step again. It's a one-time step just to get you in the system. And then you can just apply for grants till your heart's content. So um, next slide, please. So in addition to our grants, we do have some other resources. We have our teaching artist roster, and this is about 50 artists who are located throughout the state. 
in a variety of artistic disciplines. And they're available to lead residencies of varying lengths um, with different audiences. And you'll see on their page which audiences they prefer to work with when their availability is and, um, and that kind of thing. They can, um, you know, they're, they're pretty flexible, especially, especially these days. Um, so, you know, you can feel free to call us and talk to them about, um, you know, if it looks like that artist might be a good fit for your school, talk to them about what a residency might look like and see if it'll be a good fit. And all right, uh, Maria, thank you for this great question. If you're new to your school, how do you find out if your school has a login? Well, you can call us. You can call, um, you can call me and my contact information will be provided at the end or email, um, or you can do the same to, to Heidi. And our, our website, arts.ok.gov, you can find contact information for our entire staff. And um, we will be happy to help you out. We can, we can easily look that up. If you're new to your school, you might need to change your login anyway, because you might have some new personnel that need to be, you know, you might have an old staff person that was listed as a grant contact. You might need to change that. So, you know, just um, call or an email and we can help get you on the way. Um, so thanks for that question, Maria. And um, additional resources this summer, we launched a new resource, Online Fine Arts Curriculum. And the ones that I have pulled out here, that we have 14 different curricula on our website in different artistic disciplines, but these are ones that are specifically for high school audiences. So we have a drama project, a music, and two visual arts projects, and they all seem pretty interesting. We had, um, we put out a call for artists, and then whenever the artists submitted, we had, we really had a huge response. And, um, we were able to um, invite, or you know, based on the applications, we were able to select a really strong group for the first, for the first kind of round of this, and we're hoping to expand these in the future. But um, these are free to use, free for the public. You can just visit our website, and they're designed for either three lessons or six lessons. So um, you can follow those along, and um, each each lesson has step by step, you know, what you need. And we ask the artists to kind of for their supplies, um, think about students who are at home who may not be around specialized materials. So, you know, we ask them to keep the material requirements pretty, um, pretty accessible for people. So, um, so hopefully that's, that's the case for, for most of these. And I, so, um, but they're, they're really, they turned out great. And I'm really excited by the resources. And again, they're free to use. So I hope that you will take a look at these and maybe use one in your class. Um, and yeah, and they will be, uh, we'll expand upon these in the future. So that's it. And then, and then addition, additional to that, there are some organizations in our state and nationally that have been putting a lot of great content on the web that's free to use. Here in Oklahoma City, we have the Arts Council OKC and um, they have a pretty very, you know, check whenever you're looking at these and make sure that, because uh, they offer lessons for all ages. So, you know, if you're working with alt ed students, you don't want to provide them with a first grade lesson or something, but, you know, check, check that. But they've um, got a, a really um, deep library there. And with AHA, the Arts and Humanities Council in Tulsa, they've got a a big library at their social distance studio and tons of resources that these local artists have put together. And then if you want to think um, further afield, the Metropolitan Museum of Art has a, a good amount of visual arts lessons and the Kennedy Center has a ton of performing arts lessons. So, you know, those are some good places to go that are free for you to use at any time. You want to, you know, add in a lesson, um, just sprinkle a, a standalone lesson in to your day then that would be a great place to go. And, uh, and there you go. Okay, here's contact information. You can contact me for questions about uh, writing grants, program ideas. Heidi Costello is the queen of login requests and she is the best person to help you navigate that. Thomas Tran is our grants director. And so if you've applied for a grant and you have question about managing it, about payments, he is the, the person to talk to about all of those concerns. So that's us and that's it for me, I believe. Awesome, thank you. And then for the rest of us, this is also our contact information. So you can get a hold of me via email. And then I also have some things on social media. 
if you want to follow along with that. Um, Maria's email address and Morgan's email address are both on there. And if you have questions about curriculum or things that you could possibly do, they'd be more than happy to help you out. They have lots of years of experience and um, with different age levels and areas even across the country. So they would be more than happy to help you if you have any questions as they arise trying to work through an arts curriculum. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we will take time for questions. The whole presentation with the links will be available afterwards. So you'll be able to get to all of that in the future. So if you have questions, you can add them to the chat or looks like maybe we could unmute as well. I have a question for Jennifer. Is there still available funds in both of those grants for Alt Ed, the $500 one and the other one? Yes, absolutely. We are, um, so this year with our supply grant, we offered it in a, a fall semester and a spring semester. The spring semester is open now and the applications are due um, February 1st. So definitely if that's something that's of interest to you, please hop on uh, hop on that as soon as you can. And, but yes, we, we definitely have funds um, available to grant out in both of those categories. Okay, thank you. Others? Well, thank you, <clears throat> Elizabeth. We don't want to uh, keep people if they don't have any questions. And I do appreciate you all for providing your, your information. Again, these uh, presentations will be posted uh, on our website uh, as well, on the audit website. And of course, you can always contact me or Missy or Leslie. Uh, thanks for those links. Awesome, awesome. Jennifer. <laughs> Sorry, I think it posted twice and it looks like just a wall of text. So I apologize. Those are just some, some links that I mentioned. So sorry to spam the whole. That's awesome. So if you, you guys have the ability to save the chat, you'll have those uh, or click on them real quick and then you could bookmark them on your website. Uh, but we appreciate you. Um, if there are no questions, um, just want to thank you again for uh, joining us for today's presentation on arts education. We do have some schools, like Missy said, that are doing some great things and making it work. And we really appreciate that because um, it is a difficult time uh, trying to make sure students are engaged and to get resources. Um, so, and Elizabeth, thank you for putting this awesome team together. We look forward to seeing you all next year. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to put you on our traveling schedule. Uh, anything else, Missy, Leslie? No, I will be sending out your PD sheets. If you need a PD, if you can email me or put it in the chat with your email. Um, but I'll, I'll send those out in the next 10 minutes. Thank you. I guess we'll let everybody go and uh, appreciate all our guest speakers. Take care and take care of yourselves. It's very important to take care of yourselves. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs>